And if you're doing all of this stuff on the up and up and you're good to go, then it's a compliment. But I'm not sold. And if I were Greg, I'd be like, yeah, no, you're not making us look very good. Yo, welcome back after three weeks of the CrossFit semifinals. I have for you guys my nine biggest wins and my nine biggest losses over the course of these past three weeks. We're going to dig directly in with a loss. And the biggest loss is going to be the inconsistency in judging. Wow. There should be no surprise that that's going to be what it is coming out of at least my YouTube channel. Why is it such a big loss, Andrew? Well, we're going to go and look at Amanda Barnhart and McKenna, McKenna Insulin. And what you're going to see between these two athletes are squat snatches, which are without doubt below parallel, at least from what we can see. And Amanda Barnhart's isn't quite as clear, but McKenna, there is absolutely no doubt that she has hit the bottom of a squat snatch. These are interesting. And they're interesting because I've spoken a little bit with Amanda Barnhart since this, and she tried to appeal this rep. CrossFit said that they are not going to be giving athletes back repetitions on the squat snatch. They said that it was a good snatch and that they did end up taking that judge out of the competition as a result of this. This call. But the biggest thing that's interesting about this isn't that fact. It's that in the week previous, I've caught wind that Cole Sager was no rep on his final ring muscle up on the final event. And Pat Vellner's joining in, but Brandon Luckett, first yep. to strike, he moves with. So they had to do 15 of them. Remember, before they moved on to the walking lunge, and on his 15th rep, he was given a no rep, had to do another one. You can see very clearly on his lunges that he gets across the line at 253, 254. Go to the leaderboard, and you see that he has a time of 248. <laughs> And they're thinking, that's not what it said. That doesn't make any sense. But he was given, he was granted an appeal of a no rep. Oh, well. Looking at the no rep, you see that he probably didn't lock out his elbows at the top of the repetition. So how can you reverse that call? You can't. You, you can't reverse that call. It doesn't matter. And how is it that Amanda Barnhart is being denied an appeal? You cannot be given repetitions back where Cole Sager was given a rep back in the week previous. It makes no freaking sense to me at all. I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. And we had to start off the video hot with probably the biggest loss of the week. And there it is right there, judging inconsistency. And that's just one piece of evidence. Now let's go to what I think is the biggest win of the weekend. Yeah, we had part of the bad of the good. And the best thing that happened over the three weeks is Haley Adams' performance. She finished sixth overall. That's because she had a 35th place finish on event number two. But she is the only woman, uh, I don't know, there was someone who, who, who finished second on that one, the handstand walk one. She won event number four. She won event number four. And if it weren't for event number four, Tia Toomey would have won every single event. So she's the only thing standing between Tia to me and dominance, complete dominance, dominance, whatever sort of dominance. She went far and above what everybody assumed she was going to do on the squat snatch workout, finishing in the top 10 with an eighth overall. I think that everyone would have figured she would have been around 20th. So that was amazing to see. But the best thing that happened in the entire weekend for Haley Adams, in my opinion, happened before any of the exercising took place. She got her hand on the pylon and there's this awesome shot she posted on her Instagram where she's getting ready to start the event and she looks up the camera and she lets out a smile. And if you saw the video that I put up with her from sometime in February, you'll see that her coaches, Josh and Haley. One of the questions that we asked her at the very beginning was, what what would your goal be for this year if we took the leaderboard out of it? You know, if that wasn't a factor at all, what would your goal be? And I think she had to sit and think about that for a little bit. And um, oh, hopefully she doesn't mind me sharing this, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, one, of, one of her goals was, I want to walk out on the floor and smile. And I'm like, that is very doable. You know, oh, <laughs> said that one of the only things that they wanted for Haley out of this year was for her to be on the floor and to smile and to enjoy her time out there. So I think that that video, probably the best part of every single semifinal, at least in my biased opinion. And on the flip side of that, my second biggest loss of the weekend is going to go to Annika Greer and Heather Christoffel. Annika Greer, who missed by three points last year and one point this year. And a lot of people had written her off after the first event. It was cool to see her kind of climb her way all the way back, only to completely lose it on the final event yeah man i feel like uh as far as the fitness side of it it's it's fun but i feel like i feel called for some reason into like being around all these athletes going through all this i feel like i have a little bit of a testimony to try to help them through the man i came up a place short or i got dinged out but like my worth and my value isn't based on where i place right i know we get judged on that a lot in the sport but being able to conquer that's a big thing it's taken me obviously right a couple years of doing it but so this year Make the games, goal, 
it's the goal. It's been but a goal, and then we'll honestly, see. just to enjoy and fitness as much as I can while trying to serve in the coaching space too. Maybe take a little stress off the competing side too. Which is exactly what Tyler did as well. But Tyler didn't really have too bad of a first event. He always loses it on the final. And you're starting to think, is this a trend with these athletes? Does Annika just not have it on the first event? And does Tyler just absolutely fall apart every single time the cards are up against him? Annika is 21, Tyler is 34. Who knows what's to come for these athletes, but those are the things that they have to work on when it comes to competing in the future. The first event and the final event. When we're talking about events and athletes, we're going to go back to the win and it just looks like I was right. I'm always right. Andrew Hiller is always right. He made a video. And if I just look at the events as is, it's probably a little bit favoring a larger athlete. Just a little bit, like ever so slightly. Wow. He, I, yeah. Andrew Hiller made a video about the workouts when they came out. And he said that there was a partial bias towards the larger athletes. And now you could totally see that. But only on the men's side. The men had an advantage when it came to the size of the athlete. And they get a win, the second win. Up and down the leaderboard, you're going to see male athletes over 210 pounds. Which brings me to my third loss. The programming for the men. You don't need to have two echo bikes. You don't need to do it. It's like last year where you had three runners. Have you learned nothing? Nothing! I was happy that they had no torque tank this year. But the biggest observation that I made over the course of these three semifinals outside of the use of machines was the need to execute. And there were no log jams. There was no gymnastics buildup. And that is different for the men than it was for the women. So I think that the programming was phenomenal for the women. I'm not saying it's a win, but I'm saying it was much better for the women than it was for the men. And the only way that I can really think about it is imagining running straight through a field. In years past, there's always holdups, whether it be a barbell that's too heavy or a large portion of gymnastics that you need to chip up and slow down to do. And everyone just run full speed ahead. And the bigger the athlete you are, the easier you can just like push the pylon over, push the pylon over. I would imagine that the rope climbs are supposed to be a little bit of a holdup and it didn't really play out that way. Maybe the ring muscle ups are supposed to be a little bit of a holdup, but not anymore. They were for the women, slowed them down a little bit. But that pylon that you could just plow through as a larger athlete on the male side, you couldn't do on the female side. Slowed them down a little bit. So my third loss is the programming for the men. To win for the larger athletes, it's a loss for the men's programming. Win number four is going to be the attendance at the Torian and at the European semifinal at least from what you can see on the stream. And from what I've spoken with, people who have been there, from what it appears, there was two or three times the number of people that there were at the North American semifinals, which is the loss here. I don't know why. I don't think that anybody should say that, oh, it's Memorial Day weekend. It would give people more of a reason to go to the event if they didn't have anything to do, you dummies. Idiot. You didn't have work on Monday, so you go to the CrossFit events all weekend. The dumbest comment ever, oh, Memorial Day weekend. Over in Australia, it was Australian Day weekend with the kangaroos, uh, saluting the kangaroo. You didn't hear no one talking about that. But the win goes to the over the seas semifinals and the loss goes to the North American semifinals. My fifth loss of the weekend has to do with event number three. Freaking event number three, dude. I tried to say this at an Instagram post that when you tell somebody how to do something, you're getting very close to it being a beauty pageant. There is a mountain of controversy when it comes to the Arnold, you know, the bodybuilding people, they're standing on stage and they're like, look at how jacked I am. The judges are sitting there and they go, you know what? He's more jacked than he is. Is that what you think, you think? And everyone's saying, well, they just paid that judge to say that Chris Bumstead is way more jacked than everybody else. And it's all perception and it's all opinion. And somebody made those opinions. But the thing about CrossFit that's been so great is that there is no gray area. There should be no gray area. It really started to get fuzzy when the V sit-up was implemented and the GHD standard said, hey, your butt can be here, but not here in relation to where the pad is. And when you start doing things like that, it gets dangerous. Danger zone. Very much like in football where it's like, hey, you're not allowed to hit the quarterback he starts to slide and then the quarterback like kind of starts to slide and then the freaking guy has to lay off and then the quarterback doesn't slide and then there's no call and everyone loses their freaking mind all the europeans are like what the, the, what they're sliding what's football but anyway the rule here is that you have to step off of the box everybody saw that roman jumped off the box right the CrossFit Games completely disregarded that by putting it up on every platform that they could. Look at this race! It shouldn't have been a race because that judge should have told Roman that he had to come back. This is not about Roman. This is not about Roman. It's not about Roman. It's about the judging. It's about the fact that the CrossFit Games put the judge into that position to make that call because they're so stupid. We're trying to save their Achilles tendons. Well, how did that work out for Bill Leahy? It didn't. I'm convinced that the reason that that thing gave out was because you make people like Bill step off of the top of the box. 
box. Oh well. You know, you got your foot on the top of the box and for like 100 reps, you gotta do this with your ankle as you're pivoting off of the top of the box. A nice grinding on the Achilles tendon that you put everybody through in CrossFit games. That is after the 500 double unders you did this morning. Oh well. The rope climb that you didn't tell people that they had to take it easy on the way down of. Oh well. The argument here is that if you do not implement a step down on the box jump over, that everybody now has to do the rebounding box jump. My argument is put a taller box in there. Obviously. Make it 40 inches for the men. No one's going to rebound a 40 inch jump. Make it a burpee box jump over. Because there were no burpees at the semifinal, you could have made a burpee box jump over. And when we're talking about forcing people to do things because you don't implement something, you are forcing everybody to freaking dive bomb off of the top of the rope because you didn't implement that freaking standard where you have to come down halfway before you let go. Oh well. Oh well. And then you told everyone that they had to be within the lines as they were doing the box jump overs. And you can see that no one was listening to that, including Dell and Pepper, who was the other one who was racing Roman and also Taylor Self who was making claims about Dallin on the workout. He stepped outside the line on his final rep. John, John, don't, no, shut up, shut up. <laughs> Listen to me. The rep is completed. They specifically told us, they specifically told us the rep is completed when both feet touch the ground on the other side of your box inside the white line. Oh well, oh well. Event three was a loss. And where event three was a loss on every single way that you can look at it, event six was a win. Why was event six a win, Andrew? Well, it was a fantastic race. And all I can remember is last year where they had that stupid round over round with the bag and the toes to bar and again, the echo bike. I don't even remember what the year previous, but we haven't had a good finale, a good race like that in quite a while. And actually the best part about event six was the fact that it was so short. You didn't have to wait 20 20 minutes to get through every single person. Because if you have a 20 minute event, you're waiting for almost two hours to get through everything. And that's just for one of the freaking sexes. You got the men go, and then you gotta wait another two hours to watch the women go. But the turnover of the event six was really, really nice. It's almost like there should be a CrossFit event where every event is in the four to eight minute time domain. Makes you think. The next loss goes to CrossFit media. And this is something that probably I'm the only one on the planet that noticed. And it's that everybody was out on the floor there was so many people in CrossFit media shirts. But, but where that makes my mind go is what are these people doing the other 365 days of the year? Sorry, if this is three weeks of semifinals, you gotta take 21 days off of that and all of a sudden you're thinking 340 four days. What are they doing the other 344 days out of the year? Nothing! Look at all of them! They're everywhere. What do they do? What is this camera angle of Daniel Brandon? Could you imagine if Sevon did that? The other thing that I noticed that I bet nobody else noticed is that the CrossFit YouTube channel hasn't put up a video in three weeks. It's probably because they sent everybody to every single location only for them to not do anything the whole time. Make stupid little TikTok videos. Didn't you guys know that 40 year olds aren't on TikTok? Didn't you know that 40 year olds are the ones that you should be talking about to get into the affiliates? Didn't you know that 40 year olds are the ones with all the money? Didn't you know that 40 year olds love YouTube? They love it. If you wanna talk about how pitiful and how abysmal and how much this belongs in my losses column, then you gotta to go to the other end of the pendulum and you gotta to go to the wins. And somewhat self-serving, but it's the Sevon verse is my next win. And in particular with the Sevon verse, it goes to Taylor Self because what you're going to get out of CrossFit media is absolutely nothing. Name one single athlete that you're going to take away a storyline from over the course of the freaking three weeks. Zero, absolutely zero. And I watched all of it. I watched as much as I could. CrossFit goes around the world and spends millions of dollars to put on these events. And there is not one single connection that you're going to make through that. Zero. And there is a reason that when you go on the live stream and you see when Bill Leahy is going, comments galore, go Bill, go Bill. Or they're saying, Hiller talked this guy up too much, but either way, they're talking about Bill Leahy. And that is peanuts compared to Taylor freaking self. There would be a women's heat going in South America and someone would be going, hey, when's Taylor going? When Taylor was going, every single comment was about Taylor, every single one. And why is that? Because of the Sevon verse. And if you're not in the Sevon verse, you're out. Sorry, you got nothing. Nothing! Zero! Because the Sevon verse is CrossFit media. I don't know what number loss this is at this point, but we got Colton, we got Farlow, we got Uldis, and we got Yona Koski. When I look at Yona, it doesn't make any sense. When I look at Uldis and when I look at Colton, it has to do with a point that I made earlier that it was a semifinal that really favored the larger athletes. And you can see that when they did as well as they did on the first two events and they fell off the rest of the weekend, it's one of the clearest indicators of that point that I made. Jack Farlow, I got no freaking idea. And the coolest thing about what Farlow said right here, I believe he is a loss for having not made the games. He made a post saying, I don't know what happened. I wasn't sick. There was nothing wrong. I just didn't perform. Cool to see somebody that young owns something like that. It wasn't just like a black and white picture saying, oh, 
Farlow, man, bam, 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 bam. Cool on Farlow, good job, Farlow. Next year, look out for Farlow. And then where we have those four losing out, we have these four who are winning. You've got Gee, you've got Spiegel, you've got Brooke Wells, and you've got Saxon Panchik. I made a video last year saying that Gee and Spiegel are done. They're never making the games again. I made a video a couple weeks ago saying that Spiegel was going to make it based upon the workouts. I made a video saying that Gee was unlikely to make it, that is until they gave him another spot, which almost guaranteed him to make the CrossFit games. And then the next two, they got as far away from proven as they could, that being Brooke Wells and Saxon Panchik. We don't believe in coincidences, but they both didn't make it. Both had a similar injury at last year's semifinal. This year they come back having done their own stuff with their own people. I think Saxon is with Facundo. I think Brooke is with HWPO. And now they're back into the game. Let's do another win before we go into another loss. We're gonna talk about CrossFit Mayhem. On the men's side, in the East, seven men. Seven men. And Seth Stovall was right on the outside looking in. He would have been the eighth. Tyler Christopher was in 14th. That's nine. Dre Strom was in 15th. That's 10. Out of the top 15 people are all from CrossFit Mayhem. Wow. Dude. <laughs> Dude, you know what's crazy about CrossFit Mayhem is that most, if not all of them, train at Mayhem. Made a video on that. You can see some of the faces in that video. That is what a camp looks like. That is what a team looks like. When you're on the Chicago Bears, you play on the Chicago Bears. What's interesting is Tyson Bajit, the quarterback for the Chicago Bears, is on the Chicago Bears. It's currently a training camp for the Chicago Bears. We'll spend the whole year playing for the Chicago Bears. If he said all of those things, but spent all of his time in Virginia, it wouldn't make any sense. You'd go, all right, we, we understand that you're on the Bears but you're in Virginia? Huh? That doesn't make any sense. Which brings me to the losses. And that's all the other camps. And yeah, I'm talking about HWPO. I'm talking about Proven. I'm talking about, I don't know, is comp train even a thing? Did they send a single athlete to the semifinals? I don't think so. But you got Mayhem, who sent 10 of the 15 dudes in the North America East to the games. Sorry, 10 of the 15. We're in the top 15. Whatever. It doesn't matter! And then you've got Proven, who lost a handful of athletes that I've brought up. I don't think Will Morad's over there anymore. I know that Saxon's not there. I'm pretty sure Brooke is now over at HWPO. You've got the athletes like Kerstetter, who didn't make it out of the West. Very much like my observation of Ben Bergeron with Katrin David's daughter and Matt Fraser of old. I don't think that Bergeron had anything to do with the creation of Fraser and the creation of Katrin. I think that they were on the up and up. I think he caught lightning in a bottle. And I think he rode that into the freaking stratosphere. Good for you, Ben. But you're not fooling me. You're not fooling a lot of people. It wasn't you. It wasn't comp train. It wasn't your workouts. It wasn't your mindset. It was that they were going to do what they were going to do. And when I look at the Kaylee and Souza's out of Brazil with Proven, and when I look at Jay Crouch over in uh, the Oceana, lightning in a bottle. It wasn't Proven that turned them into who they are. They were bound to do well. They did well before Proven. But you got Kerstetter. You got Luis Oscarmora. You got Sydney Wells who couldn't even, they couldn't even get out of the freaking semifinal. But the win here has to go to Tia. Because where everything that Proven wasn't doing so hot, Tia was doing hot, winning five of the six events. It's almost like her and Shane sat down, they opened up a book and they go, okay, uh, we lost this person. They're not gonna do so good. They're not gonna make it out of the quarterfinals into the semifinals. They're moving, they left us, they left us. You're gonna have to compete again this year, Tia. You're in, you got that? Willow, are you cool with that? Willow's like giving her double thumbs up. The contingency plan worked for Proven and Tia, and it's a win. My final win and loss has to go to the strength of field. And I did something. I was doing this a little bit during the show yesterday. The show, you know, the seven verse show, the recap show. And the this that I'm talking about are taking the points from other semifinals and allocating them into other regions. So how would Guy have done in the East? How would Taylor have done in the West? And what we came to see is that if you remove the first event because they weren't the same semifinal over semifinal, so you cannot compare them, you would see that Taylor self would have gotten 337 points on events two through six, meaning that he would have needed something like a fifth place or better finish on event one to have qualified, putting him just outside of the cut line, which is exactly where he finished in the East and that's a cool observation to make. The East and the West, he would have just missed it in both of them. So it's not like, oh, the East or the West was way stronger than one another. And it has a lot to do with the allocation of points, which is a win for the strength of field. There is another win in the strength of field that has to do with Guillermo Hero. If you would have taken his finishing and his time on those finishes and you would have plugged them into the East semifinal, he would have come up with 428 points over the events two through six. And again, we cannot compare event number one, but on just those events alone, he would have finished eighth overall. You would have figured he would have done at minimum a 20th place finish on that, considering he got sixth in his field, and they're all pretty good at running over down in South America, giving him another 43 points, which would have vaulted him all the way into fourth place overall, just over Jason Hopper. And I know you can't compare sticks and stones, but who knows what happens if you put him right next to everyone else, maybe it changes a little bit, I don't think so. And where those are wins, and it's cool to see, it didn't really quite work out that way for the women's side of the field. 
And if we go back into South America, you've got Victoria Campos, who if you take all of her times and her finishes from that semifinal and you plug them into the East, you're going to see that she would have accumulated 240 points. Again, that's events two through six. Even if Victoria would have won the first event over at the East, which she would not have, given the fact that she didn't even win in her own respective semifinal, she would have had no shot at making the CrossFit Games. She would have been somewhere around 15th or 16th place, maybe even arguably lower depending on how she did on that first event. And that's the person who won the women's South America semifinal, not even a qualifier in the East. And yeah, they got three of them. They got three of them. And when you look at that third spot, a familiar face pops up. I suppose it may only be familiar if you follow me on Instagram or on YouTube because this is Miss Andriana Pinheiro, AKA the least natural athlete in the field. I said yesterday on Savans that if I were in control of CrossFit, which I'm not and likely will never ever be. So if I were Greg West, but I would look down at the field, I would go, yeah, you're disqualified because you're cheating. Now remember, I am Andrew Hiller, the YouTuber, who can say whatever he wants. Oh well. The way that this should be heard if I am wrong is that it is the ultimate compliment. The reason that I say that is because this is a 41 year old female. This 41 year old female looks better than 99.9% .9 of CrossFit males of all ages. Of all ages. I'm talking she's going up there with Rich Froning in his prime, Noah Olson present day. She looks arguably better than they do at the age of 41 years old as a female. And remember the biggest claim that I have about Pinheiro here is that when when she was in her 30s, she didn't look like this. She didn't compete like this. She came out of nowhere in her older ages. If you're doing all of this stuff on the up and up and you're good to go, then it's a compliment. But I'm not sold. And if I were Greg, I'd be like, yeah, no, you're not making us look very good. By the way, I did the strength of field thing with her as well. She would have had 153 points in the East without that first event. So right there, she would have been in 32nd. Let's give her maybe another 50. So if you give her another 50, she would have been in the bottom 15, 25th or 26th overall in the East. And that individual as you went to the CrossFit Games. And one more note, Miss Pinheiro, you're just smarter than all of us. There's a reason you don't get caught. You're smarter than all of us, and that's okay. Another compliment. We're all dumb, you win. Closing notes on the weekend. This is just something that I like to do, and you might tune out at this point, but the Sunday stream of the North America East semifinal got 631,000 views. The Sunday stream of the West got 520,000 views, and the Sunday stream of Europe got 404,000 views. And year over year, these are kind of similar. I am not entirely 100% convinced that these are all legitimate views. I'm not, and you can't convince me of that. I know that there are people whose jobs depend on the fact that these get good numbers. But the interesting thing about it is that the North American semifinals did do better than the European semifinals. It's not due to attendance. So while there might be more people in the live competition, which by the way, the Oceania semifinal on Sunday got less than half of the North America East semifinal did with 253,000. Point that I wanna make about this is if it gets 631,000, I clicked onto that stream about 30 times, maybe 50. Some Somewhere between 30 and 50 times I was in there, in and out. I mean, as I was recording this video, I went in and out of it three times, which gives them three more views. As long as you click onto it and you stay there for three to five seconds, you're going to give them a view. The Sunday stream had three events. Now let's assume that you watch an event and you go do something and you come back and you watch an event and you come back and you watch another one. That's three separate times you're in and out of the stream, minimum. So when there's 631,000 views, you can almost immediately divide that into three, giving you 210,000 people who had watched it. And I'm gonna bet that most cross Fitters are more like myself where they're watching it 30 to 50 times. Uh-uh, I changed my mind. I'm insane. No one else did that, but let's just say that it's five times. Your average everyday CrossFitter goes on to it a couple times. There's gonna be some people who watch it one, let's say on average, 631,000 divided by five, it got 126,000 unique viewers, which is a real thing. Because if I go to my CrossFit Mayhem video, which had 133,000 views, it had about 80,000 unique viewers. Now that's a one time through long video. All that means is that someone watched it, stopped watching it and came back to watch it later. If I go to my most recent video, Danny Spiegel Strikes Again, I go to my audience, I can see that I had 32,000 unique viewers. It's a shorter video, but that means that 8,000 people were in there more than once. The longer the video, the more reason there is to come back to it multiple times, the more times you're going to come up, the less unique viewers you have. So when you look at that, stop looking at it as, oh, 600,000 people watched it. Uh-uh. That's not the way it works. In all reality, it was probably somewhere around 100 to 200,000 people watched it, which is great, but everything needs to be relative. And I would bet my left nut that the people who are putting this thing on, the people who are in charge of CrossFit Media over there, and the people who are now talking to the private equity people saying, look at how good our stream did. The final week had 630 viewers. It's like, that means that 630, uh-uh, that means that 100 to 200,000 people probably watched it. Those are my wins and my losses. That's all I have to say about that. 
Let's get ready for the CrossFit Games. And Riller, out. They smashed that live, but no one touched their nose. Let's just do it! Make your dreams come true! Just do it! Something to dream of success while you're gonna wake up and work hard at it! Nothing is impossible! No, what are you waiting for? Do it! Just do it! Yes, you can!